So what I want to do today is just very, I want to introduce this to you very quickly, is, um, and I was gonna show you this at the, other, uh, at the end of the last class, if we simply go to the far end of the scale, the picometer scale, you see carbon. I'm not gonna start you with carbon, that is a little dull, but over the next few weeks, a uh, few classes rather, because we have to do this in fast order, we will go from, uh, we will cover uh, details of carbohydrates, amino acids, nucleosides, and phospholipids, and how those building blocks are put together their properties, their ability to interact and engage um, in non-covalent interactions with other molecules, and, co and um, the ability to make polymers out of some of these, such as the nucleosides and the amino acids and the carbohydrates, which then start to create the richness of life. We will also discuss today the supramolecular chemistry of phospholipids as they make micelles and lipid bilayers, which are the key uh, boundary of cells, so it's very important. And then in the following week, we'll go to some of the, the bigger things like proteins, uh, uh, nucleic acid, polymers, for example, here's uh, RNA. So the course will literally do this take you from one end of the scale to the other. So I want you to get a sense of um, these dimensions. I want to mention one sort of fairly stupid thing with respect to how chemists and biochemists talk about certain metrics, certain distances that are pertin pertinent to, the bio uh, to biology and biochemistry. Um, engineers tend to talk about micrometers and nanometers. Uh, there is one unit that chemists and biologists use quite a lot. It's the angstrom. After um, a Finnish or Sw no, not Finnish. Uh, uh, I think it was a, a Norwegian, and that is equivalent. Ten angstrom equals one nanometer. So when you're looking at scales, we tend to talk about angstrom because they're a convenient number. But don't uh, don't get fooled by this. It's a, you know it can be a little bit confusing because it's ten to 10 to the negative 10. So a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9. You know that quite frequently. Picometer, 10 to the negative 12. Micrometer, negative 6. But the Armstrong is just a funny unit we use a lot, and it's 10 to the negative 10. So just to make sure there's no ambiguity about that, uh, that particular detail, OK? All right. So today's uh, lecture will focus on the molecules of life. And in particular, I'm going to, through the next few classes, introduce you to the various molecules of life. But first of all, we have to do a little bit to understand chemical bonding. And in particular, we want to look at both covalent and non-covalent bonding, because covalent bonding is important. It's the structure, it's the framework. But non-covalent bonding is what gives us dynamics. These are much weaker forces that can be broken and remade very readily that are essential for things like forming the DNA duplex, for folding your proteins, for um, associating the lipid bilayer. All of those are non-covalent forces, and they are dynamic because they're weak. You can break one relatively easily as long as you're ready to make another one in its place. So um, I will spend a little bit of time on that, and then today we'll talk about lipids and membranes. But first of all, let me introduce you to some of the molecules of life in this rendition that's done by David Goodsell at Scripps. So up in the top corner here, you look at 2.3, is the three-dimensional structure of a protein. It's folded into a globular state through uh, no, uh, non-covalent forces. I brought a little uh, 3D model of a protein for you to look at and uh, take a look at later. That was one of the suggestions I made. You could coordinate printing a 3D model as your, one of your later projects. Um, we will learn about the forces that hold the polymer together, the covalent forces, but then the, the non-covalent forces that make globular structures that are very important for function. They're not much use as unraveled spaghetti. They're way more useful as their three-dimensional structure. Um, down here in the corner is a carbohydrate. It really looks pretty pathetic in this rendition, but carbohydrates have a lot of value, particularly in energy storage, but also in things like the extracellular matrix and as entities that single, signal information between cells. There's a lot of communication done by cell surface carbohydrates. Over here, you see the canonical structure of double-stranded DNA. 
We'll look at the covalent structure of those single strands, but then we'll focus in on the non-covalent interactions that make the double-stranded DNA and store genetic information, which is also central to life. And then lastly on this, but we'll cover this today, is a lipid bilayer. It's a fascinating supramolecular structure that really is at the heart of how all your cells are held in a compartment surrounded by a lipid bilayer. So by the time we start talking about those, you'll understand the forces that put in place that lipid bilayer that arguably, and I've read articles that say this, that is the evolution of lipid bilayers is as important as the genetic code because if cells did not have a surrounding, did not have an inside where you could concentrate reagents and macromolecules and do biochemistry, we wouldn't exist as we, life wouldn't exist in the same way. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the composition of uh, living systems. And uh, remarkably, we are about <laughs> 75% water. So most proteins are very hydrated. There's a lot of water in cells. There's a lot of water outside of cells in the matrix. And really we, we sort of survive, we, we survive in an aqueous environment. And the thing that you also want to think about is when we think about non-covalent forces, these are forces put in place in water. We don't live in a, on a far distant planet where we're in sort of liquid methane or anything like that. So water is critical to life. Uh, the establishment of the hydrosphere when Earth, f Earth first formed, the evolutionary events that happened after that were, to, were really in hand in hand with the fact that it was an aqueous environment. Because forces are different whether they are in hydrophobic environments or hydrophilic environments. And uh, really you'll start to get appreciation for that as we move forward. So this basically suggest that if I put one of you in a giant desiccator and pumped out all the water I could possibly pull out, there'd be about sort of, depending on your weight, 40 pounds of things left behind. Of what's left behind, the majority of it is going to be biological macromolecules, whoops. And then the rest of it, that little slither, are things like ions and small molecules, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, those, uh, those small inorganic ions, as well as small molecule metabolites that are involved in central metabolism. Let's go now look at the macromolecules and their sort of proportions relative to each other. The smallest slither are the lipids, which we'll talk about today. Then you have the nucleic acids that are critical for information storage. You have proteins, which make the largest piece of the pie, and carbohydrates, which are um, one of the, uh, is the 25%. So you can see how important carbohydrates are because of their proportion being relatively large. The lipid proportion, though, is small, but absolutely critical, harking back to the membrane bilayer, because if we didn't have the membrane bilayer, once again, we wouldn't have life in the same way that we have it now. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of the relative proportions of things. And frankly, when I discuss the macromolecules, I really like to start with lipids because of the membrane bilayer, but because their structures are comparatively simple relative to amino acids and nucleic acids. So we can get a few of the basics of the chemical structures down and how we render them uh, on paper so that we can do that with lipids, which are a little simpler. Now, life, um, to, an, to a chemist, they have to sort of worry about this entire mess of the periodic table. But the good news for you is, for biological systems, we deal with very focused components of the periodic table. So those biological macromolecules are made up largely of only six elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur. So that makes your, prob your the amount of stuff you need to know about basic covalent structures way more simple than it is for the average chemist who has to worry about everything down here in the nether regions and whoops, what are you doing? Uh, and the things that are things that are radioactive, all kinds of other things. You don't have to worry about any of that. So the covalent bonding we will talk about is um, amongst those six different elements. Uh, and they make up 98% of the cellular mass. And then the other components that are important in cells are some metal ions, the alkali and alkali earth um, uh, elements, so sodium, magnesium, 
potassium, calcium, those are all quite important in life. And then these transition metal ions that are really important in enzyme catalysis, for example, but we will not cover very much of that. But those are what are known as trace elements that are very, uh, as um, transition metal elements that are very important for biochemistry. And then last of all, there are some rogue ones that there's even smaller amounts in physiologic systems. These are things like chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten, selenium, and iodine. And of those, certain of these elements only are found in totally bizarre organisms. So for example, uh, you and I don't have much molybdenum and tungsten, I don't think, unless it slipped in there by accident. But you and I definitely need selenium and iodine as trace elements. Does anyone know where iodine comes and figures most prominently? Yeah. Thyroid, absolutely. So the thyroid hormone is a small organic molecule with uh, several iodines in it. And we need, absolutely need iodine in our diet in order to build the thyroxine hormone that, pro that deals with a lot of aspects of metabolism. So we don't need a lot. And if we get too much, it's bad for you, but we definitely need traces of these elements. Now, um, I will spend um, a very small amount of time just laying down the basics of organic chemistry bonding. Now, who of you have either taken the chemistry GIR or had high school chemistry quite recently? Is that pretty much all of you? And now, if you didn't put your hand out, don't worry. We're here to bring you up to speed if you need it. Frankly, if you just know what's on the next two, two or three slides, you're in great shape. All the information that you need has been condensed. But if it's a little bit out of nowhere, you could come see me in office hours, and I can just run through things to, for you, and we can just get you up to speed. There is no need for pre-knowledge. I just need an idea of how much pre-knowledge you have. So when we talk about covalent bonding and start to think about the, the elements that are critical for life, it's important to consider the electronic structures of these elements and why, why they happen to be the chosen elements, okay? The most important thing about hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur is they love to make covalent bonds. A lot of metal ions form salts, you know, sodium chloride or many other different salts, but covalent bonds are the main structure of our macromolecules. Strong bonds between elements such as these six, in particular these six, where they share electrons in covalent bonds rather than form ionic interactions where somebody gives an electron to someone else and you have a plus minus type interaction. So these shared bonds are important for life. So it's good to understand why hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and then phosphorus and sulfur are so important. In order to understand the covalent bonding of these elements, um, it's useful to know the electronic configuration, but you could live without that. The most important important thing is that covalent bonds, such as the one between carbon and hydrogen here, rep reflects a shared pair of electrons, one from the hydrogen, one from the carbon, to make a stable covalent bond. Because of its electronic configuration, carbon is neutral when it has four covalent bonds. Nitrogen is neutral when it has three covalent bonds, but there's an extra lone pair of electrons that are not forming bonds in neutral nitrogen. And oxygen is neutral when it has two covalent bonds. These could be with hydrogen, they could be with carbon, they could be with uh, several of the other elements. For carbon, we don't deal with charged states of carbon because they're pretty high energy. They may be high energy intermediates in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, but they're not sitting there as high energy intermediates in your macromolecules. Uh, the, the key thing you want to notice is for all of these elements, the valence shell is complete with eight electrons. But these lone pairs, and I, uh, or bunny ears as people like to call them, really feature very prominently in biochemistry and biology because they are places for hydrogen bonding interactions. So we run a lot on electrostatic hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interactions. If we know where the lone pair electrons are, 
we know one part of a hydrogen bonding interaction. It turns out that in biology, we're mostly at pH 7 or in that range, except for a few subcellular compartments. But at pH 8, nitrogen lone pair of electrons will pick up a proton to become a positively charged nitrogen. And you'll mostly see that as a positively charged. So the side chain of lysine, which has an NH3, uh, uh, an NH2 at the very end of a carbon chain, is most commonly protonated and positively charged. So it could be involved in an interaction. Uh, so we can consider both the neutral and the charged, positively charged state of nitrogen. For oxygen, that oxygen lone pair will, can pick up a proton to form the hydronium ion. So that's a positively charged OH group. So it would have an extra proton using up a lone pair or, and three hydrogens or it could give up a proton to form the hydroxide ion. And those are the states of oxygen that are most common. So in that, you've, you've, we've kind of dispatched the, those first four of the six elements. Um, phosphorus and sulfur are a little tricky, but there is some good news. Uh, Sulfur copies oxygen, so you don't really have to worry too much about sulfur. You'll just consider it to really be a, sort of an older sibling of oxygen where all the chemistry is very, very similar. Sulfur or the negatively charged sulfur anion are both important. Phosphorus is different. Phosphorus does not tend to show up in the version that copies nitrogen. It is, it is capable of adopting higher oxidation states and all of the phosphorus you meet in biochemistry, uh, for the most part, there's a few odd things in weird organisms, is going to be in the form of an oxidized form of phosphorus, which generally has one, two, three, four, five bonds to phosphorus. It can take on a higher oxidation state, and you will see phosphorus. Phosphorus in the phosphate form is absolutely essential to life because it's the place where we store a ton of reactivity for the reactions of nucleotides, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, the phosphodiester backbone in nucleic acids, phosphorylation of amino acids to form phosphoproteins. It's always in this state with all the, ex the extra oxygens and that, that, that configuration of bonds, okay? If you know this, you've got a lot of the covalent bonds under control. So any questions about this? Is everyone all right? I know it might be, it's probably a refresher for most of you. The next thing I just briefly want to mention is the most typical um, uh, functional groups that occur in biological molecules. And you may say, well, what does it mean, functional group? Usually it's a place where the action happens. If you have a large molecule that's a bunch of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen covalent bonds, there's not a lot going on unless you can really rip those bonds apart, but they're high energy. But functional groups are oftentimes where chemistry happens uh, or biochemistry happens. So there's the OH, hydroxyl. Uh, we, as chemists and biochemists, will tend to use an R where we mean something else. So we don't write out a whole structure. We would just put R, O, H, R equals, I'm going to just say anything. So, for example, if R was CH3, CH2, you would have ethanol. So, but, but I'm keeping it uh, more generic. The next functional group that is important is the carboxylate group or the carboxyl group looks like this. Now, when we look at these molecules, you always want to sort of think where the lone pair electrons are. There's two on oxygen, two on oxygen, two on oxygen. So that actually shows you where the rest of the electrons are. This is the carboxyl group. But in nature, in physiologic systems, this shows up most commonly in its anionic form. That's important, because when we start to think of interactions between enzymes and their substrates or the folding of proteins, we're thinking of something with a negative charge, not a neutral. So this group loses a proton 
to form the carboxylate group. And if you want to know where the lone pairs are now, that's what they look like. So those are two of the key ones. Let's now go to nitrogen. That is the neutral amine. But as I just mentioned to you, that will very commonly pick up a proton and be in the positively charged state. Now, when I show you both of those guys in the positively charged state, what you could immediately tell me is that if I have an amino acid with one of these groups and a nearby amino acid with one of these groups, they could form an electrostatic interaction between themselves, plus and minus complementing each other. So if you know the charge states, you're much better off because you can tell where where non-covalent types of ionic or electrostatic interactions occur. So these are very important. Then there's the phosphate group. It's often ionized. And the sulfhydryl group, so phosphate. The sulfhydryl group is also called the thiol group. And I'm sure I've spelt that wrong because hydral, uh, they look like that. And the most common state of the sulfhydryl, or not the most common, can also appear as the anionic structure. So that's the basic functional groups. Now, there are two more functional group assemblies that you will see a lot in physiologic systems that are basically composites of some of these structures. Because when we have single building blocks, we need to join them to each other through different types of chemistries. So I want to show you the types of chemistry that you get by forming a composite of a, hy uh, of a hydroxyl and a carboxyl group and a composite of a carboxyl group and an amid. Because the polymer that's the protein polymer has building blocks that have amines and carboxyls, but they're all put together into a polymeric structure where those groups have been joined in a condensation polymer. So let me just show you what those look like. And then we'll be done with the functional groups. So there are the first one, because I've drawn them in this order, Okay, is the amide, and the other one is the ester. When you do these two reactions, if you do them in the lab, they're called condensation reactions because as you form that bond, you kick out a molecule of water. These are really important new functional groups to you because your proteins are held together by amide groups. In fact, they're so important in proteins, we often call them peptide groups. You'll see more about that on Monday. And the esters are really important, for example, in derivatives of glycerol that make fatty acids or uh, phospholipids, you'll see esters occurring again and again. The other um, composite group that you can also see is with the phosphate. Plus an alcohol. And what that group looks like is as follows, and you're going to see this sort of endlessly in nucleic acids. Let's keep the charges all even here. And this is what's known as the phosphate ester. Okay, and that is yet another
condensation where you kick out water. All right, so let's just run back to this image and we can sum it all up. Those are all the groups that I just described to you. And if you want, you can go back and put lone pairs of electrons on everything. And then the composite groups that I want to mention to you in particular are the amide and the ester. And they're very important in physiologic systems. They are the bond that holds together the biopolymer in many cases. Not shown in, on, the, on this picture is the phosphate ester. I've added that this year uh, because it's kind of important. Um, is a similar condensation reaction between phosphorus and an alcohol. And uh, that in particular is what the bond you'll see that holds together nucleic acids. And now, um, one sort of thing that we won't go into a lot of detail, um, I want you to notice that this nitrogen here has a lone pair of electrons. It picks up a proton very readily. The amide nitrogen is not so willing to pick up a proton because it messes up the rest of its chemistry. So that nitrogen in an amide tends to be observed as a neutral. However, that hydrogen can be involved in hydrogen bonds. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on to non-covalent bonds? Is everything clear? Now, I try to put everything in one place so you have it in front of you. What I've put on those two slides is what you need to know about organic covalent bonding. It doesn't go beyond it. There's, I will say there's a tiny bit of memorization, but once you commit that stuff to memory, you, you're in a good place with respect to understanding how the molecules of life are put together. Okay. Now, what is more important to me, once we've put those structures in place, is non-covalent bonding. Because to me, non-covalent bonding is synonymous with dynamics, forces that can be readily broken and reassembled, broken and reassembled. The energy, the strength of a typical bond between two carbons or a carbon and a hydrogen is on the order of 90 to 100 kilocalories per mole. It takes a lot to break those bonds. We can't break them at will to go and do some biological activity. But the range of energies of the non-covalent bonds are far more modest. They range from, so this is covalent, but the non-covalent range from one maybe to about 10 kilocalories per mole. So when you think about those forces, they're readily broken and made, broken and made. And what's so amazing about protein and nucleic acid structure is that you can, you can gradually break a bond while you're making another non-covalent bond. So you can have the dynamics of the structure that define a lot of its functional properties. Because structures are dynamic, uh, an enzyme that's a, a composite of a lot of non-covalent interaction, can bind a substrate, can gradually form a set of covalent bonds with that substrate, but then can start changing the shape of that structure and that shape in order to go through a catalytic cycle to do chemistry and then to liberate products. That is all driven by changes in covalent bonding, non-covalent bonding, subtle changes that occur without big energy barriers that would be necessary to break the non-covalent bo the covalent bonds. So shown at the top here, you see the average bond energy of covalent bonds. Uh, the small number is something, uh, for example, between two chlorines. That's a pretty weak bond, but of course, we don't have a lot of them running around. Uh, so really, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, uh, they're at the higher end, the about 100 kilocalories, 80 kilocalories per mole. The other important interactions, though, that make up the non-covalent interactions are as follows. So the first important one is the ionic bond. It is also called a salt bridge or an electrostatic interaction. 
Why we give three names for this probably comes from which, which type of chemist decided to define them. They are all the same things. They are basically interactions between a positively charged entity, a protonated amine, and a negatively charged entity, a deprotonated carboxylate. Those are about the strongest of the non-covalent bonds, but it's very variable because it depends a lot on their environment. If those two entities are in a hydrophobic environment, they're gonna charge right for each other to form a strong electrostatic interaction. But if those are out in water, each of those groups could be solvated by water, and they'd have to give up solvation in order to form a good electrostatic interaction. When we talk about protein folding, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So the reason why this says very variable is not to drive you crazy, it's just they're very variable. And they're, but they will still range, I would say, from uh, two to 10 kilocalories. Come on. So those are important, easy to pick out, the strongest of the set. If uh, Dr. Ray gives you a problem set and starts asking you to pick out non-covalent interactions, that's the one you, you take care of straight away because it is the most obvious. The next most important, though, is the hydrogen bond. Now. Hydrogen bonds have been known to mystify people for years because people are, well, how do I pick these things out? How do I pick these things out? I'm going to give you a foolproof way of picking out hydrogen bonds so you will never be at a loss for hydrogen bonds, okay? Where, how do we recognize them? They are between hydrogens that are on uh, electronegative elements such as oxygen, There's, of course, there's other things attached here, uh, or on nitrogen, or on sulfur. So all of those three functional groups can serve as hydrogen bond donors. They can give a proton in a hydrogen bond and share that proton between a hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, so these are all going to be known as donors. So you can recognize them. This carbon is not a hydrogen bond donor. Carbon's got his hydrogen and is not giving it away to anybody for love or money. It's hold on tight. So this is not a hydrogen bond donor. Okay? Now, what are the hydrogen bond acceptors? Are places where that hydrogen would want to sit? Yes? Uh, Actually, they just they could be double or they could be single, um, but I was just putting them so that you see that the nitrogen has one, two, three bonds to it. Okay, yeah. It could alternatively also be the form of nitrogen, just to confuse you, that has an extra proton. It could be the protonated version because that can still be a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, now what are the hydrogen bond acceptors? They are any place where you have a lone pair so let's just think of a carbonyl group, two lone pairs, a hydroxyl group, two lone pairs, a nitrogen that is not protonated, one lone pair. Those are the hydrogen bond acceptors. So as long as you know your structures in the, co in, the, in the functional groups and you know where the lone pairs are, you can figure out where there could be a hydrogen bond. So these, all of these types are acceptors. Okay, so in protein biochemistry, for example, those kinds of um, hydrogen bonding is very, very important to form the three-dimensional structures of proteins. And the reason why is because in a protein, proteins are made up of amide bonds where this HN can be a donor. This O can be an acceptor, and you can get networks of hydrogen bonding interactions to establish structures of proteins. 
when a small molecule binds to a protein, it may look to fit in a place where it can maximize electrostatic interactions and hydrogen bonding interactions. So we'll ask you to start to be able to pick out hydrogen bonding. So here you saw the electrostatic interaction. Here is a typical hydrogen bonding interaction between a hydroxyl and a carbonyl group. I couldn't spot that very readily unless I remembered that there were lone pairs of electrons there, okay? The other two, any questions about that? Any questions about hydrogen bonding? Are you comfortable with thinking you could derive your way to figuring out where they are? You'll see them used a lot, so they'll become more and more familiar to you as, as you move forward. Okay, good. The, the last two types of interactions are the hydrophobic interactions and von der Waals forces. I never get the spelling right, but I'll get the concepts over you. Now, Hydrophobic interactions are incredibly important. So when you think of folding a protein driven solely by electrostatic interactions and hydrogen bonding, you have a bit of a problem because all of those groups are hydrogen bonded to water. So you'd have to get rid of the water before they could make interactions with each other. Does that make sense? Because we're in water, we're folding in water. Hydrophobic interactions are really great because they want to form in water. If you're making you know, a batch of salad dressing, oil and vinegar, and you shake it up, what happens? It separates. The oil goes to the top, the vinegar goes to the bottom. Why? Because of hydrophobic interactions in the oil phase. So if you have a large protein that has a bunch of hydrophobic groups, they will want to collapse out of the water to interact with each other, and then hydrogen bonding and electrostatic will fall into place. So hydrophobic interactions are a very important and vital force in nature in the non-covalent bonding. So that, uh, and those are literally interactions amongst molecules that have a lot of CH and CC bonds. The final force that's shown up there is the van der Waals force, uh, and we don't worry too much about that, but it is simply the interaction between very weakly polarized uh, carbon, hydrogen, or other types of bonds where there's a little bit of difference between the, the, a little bit of a dipole between the bond, and they form little dipolar interactions. But mostly, I think you really want to focus on the electrostatic, the hydrogen bond, and the hydrophobic. These are more minor, and it's a little bit of a subtlety. So let's focus on those three. All right. So with that said, the key thing for you, what do you need to be able to do is understand them and recognize them in complex systems. Um, lastly, I'm just going to leave this. It's going to stay in your notes. We in, in uh, biochemistry tend to use line angle drawings. Um, it's kind of complicated to draw these sort of great big things with all the hydrogens and oxygens and stuff spelled out. So we use the line angle drawing. There's some shown here for different molecules. And the rules are laid out so that you can go and just figure out, do a bit of practicing, and just figure out the line angle drawing and what it means. Basically, every line represents a bond, every vertex represents a carbon atom. But what you do show on the drawings are the non-carbon um, atoms, so for example, oxygen, or nitrogen, and when you show, you imply the hydrogens that are bonded to carbon, but you have to show the hydrogens that are on nitrogen or oxygen, for example, and you have to figure out what your charge state might be. So I'm gonna leave you with that. All right, okay, so what we've learned so far is these basic forces in biology are critical for the assembly of, uh, of the, the building blocks of biological macromolecules. What I want to talk to you about now, and we'll probably, uh, because I've spent a little bit of time on that, spill over a little more to next week, but I'm gonna to talk to you about the first class of macromolecules, which are the lipids. So 
what makes something a lipid? These are the most sort of complicated mixture of biological molecules. And formally, they're not really macromolecules, they're small molecules. But what's common to all of them is that they are very rich in carbon carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds. Because all of these, the line angle drawings of all of these would suggest to you that the dominant feature of all these molecules is a bunch of CC and CH bonds which makes the molecules quite hydrophobic. There are no functional groups there. And, uh, and they uh, behave very differently. For example, they would have a tough time dissolving in water in some cases. And so this complicated looking set of molecules can be distilled out as being very rich in carbon hydrogen and carbon carbon bonds. And we call those collectively lipids. Now, in, uh, they have a lot of different functions. So for example, triglycerides, such as shown here, with three ester bonds, a storage for energy. Things like estradiol, uh, uh, things like uh, steroids. Um, they have this six, six, five, six, five arrangement of rings. All your steroid hormones kind of look like that. A lot of CH bonds. Uh, there are some vitamins. So for example, uh, retinol is a vitamin. It's also a lipid. And then there are the phospholipids uh, shown down here. I just briefly want to mention a little bit about retinol and retinol, which are uh, crucial. Retinol is a critical vitamin. Um, it comes actually from carotene, which is a molecule that you find in a lot of orange and yellow fruits, such as carrots. Um, but the oxidized products of retinol is this lipid called retinol, which is central to the process of vision. So retinol binds to proteins that sit in the membrane. When light shines on them, the shape of the retinol changes. It goes from a particular configuration of the double bond to a different one, the shape just changes, and that sends a signal to your brain. So lipids are important, absolutely essential in vision and sight because they're involved in the signaling process because their shapes change and send signals. Um, other types of lipids are these things, and we call them fatty acids, mostly because they're greasy, long-chain acids. Uh, with a long hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic end group here. These molecules are also what are known as amphipathic because they have a sort of split personality. They have a hydrophobic moiety and a hydrophilic moiety. Whenever you see amphi at the beginning of a word, it means both. So both hydrophilic and, um, amph uh, and lipophilic. So these are important, and these are very important components. You probably heard a lot of press about some of the fatty acids and how bad trans fats are you, for you and how you should be careful to make sure your diet is rich in cis fats or, um, rather than trans fats because uh, the trans fats are contributors to coronary heart disease. So you may wonder what's the relationship between heart disease and these two types of lipophilic components which um, are in the body. So let me describe to you that relationship. Uh, remember, the cis fats are rich in things like uh, the nut oils and fruit oils, such as olive oil. So coronary heart disease is associated with trans fats. What's the linkage? What's the biology in that? So in the, the, it comes, the story is related to cholesterol. Cholesterol is a critical component in our membranes. The trouble is we have to be able to move cholesterol around but it's so hydrophobic it doesn't dissolve in water, okay? So in the body, your cholesterol is moved around in the form of lipoproteins that bind to the cholesterol and take it to the different organs where it is needed, all right? And so the lipoproteins can either be low density and um, associate with cholesterol, or they can be high density, and those also associate with cholesterol. The high density lipoproteins are kind of large, 
In fact, they're fairly agile. They don't stick to arteries and vesicles, uh, vessels, and they can be excreted in the liver or move around the bloodstream without any problem. It's the low density ones that are problems because they're low density and they kind of stick to the walls of your arteries and start making buildups and then plaques which contribute to heart disease. So the low density ones have cholesterol, but they're very small, sticky, and it's a physical interaction with your blood vessels and they start to clog your arteries. What's the relationship to saturated and trans fats is that they increase the low density lipoprotein in preference to the high density. So if you have a lot of trans fats, you make a lot of low density lipoproteins. It's trying to carry cholesterol around, but it gets stuck to your blood vessels and you start to clog your blood vessels for, for heart that contributes to heart disease. So these lipophilic molecules are important. They have places to store energy. Uh, they are critical to hormones and signaling, for example but there are some complications with disease because certain types of fatty acids contribute to heart disease. Yeah? Is it a lower density no, uh, no, it's, it's the, the density is of the, of the entire physical particle. It's a nanoparticle that would be more float, uh, would show a different density respect to how it floats in water. So the density is really um, the, the physical metric of the entire particle as opposed to just the molecule. It might be different because of the way it can pack, but it, that, um, the important thing about the trans fats is that they really contribute to making the protein that forms the low density particles. Okay, all right. So um, I'm just going to introduce these, uh, not quickly, but I'll show you some cool images uh, in a, at the beginning of the next class. This is the last group of uh, lipidic molecules, and they are actually oops, esters and phosphoesters of fatty acids with glycerol. This is a small molecule that forms esters through its oxygen to these long chains and also to phosphate. And these contribute to really important um, uh, functions in the body. They are also amphipathic because they have a hydrophobic component and a hydrophilic component. And we often draw them in a shorthand form like this to represent this head group and these tails. And I want to just leave you with this wonderful image of the sorts of supramolecular structures that these kinds of phospholipids can form. So supramolecular, molecular. It's a very important term in biology as it is in engineering, supramolecular. It means it's a structure that's above the molecular level. It's an, an, a, an aggregation of different molecules to make a super molecule with different properties from the individual components. Phospholipids self-assemble And that's another important term, into supramolecular structures that are very, very important in living systems. Some of them uh, are just a, are useful in other sorts of engineering approaches, such as liposomes and micelles, but the most important supramolecular structure of a phospholipid is the lipid bilayer that surrounds your cells. And what happens is you simply put those molecules, the phospholipids in water, and they will self-assemble on their own into these supramolecular structures. Whether they form micelles or liposomes or bilayers is dependent very much on the tails of the lipids, what sorts of shapes and structures you get. But in physiology, in human physiology, the phospholipids that we have want to form these bilayer structures that have incredibly important properties, most importantly that they are semi-permeable and they can wrap, form the boundary um, to certain cells. So I will continue with the final discussion of this on Monday before we move forward to the amino acids, peptides and proteins. And I just quickly want to move you to ask you for Monday to try to uh, catch a read of the section 3.2 in the text. If you have a chance, it'll give you a nice preview.